2022 has been declared the year of the good news here at New Freedom Church. There's lots of bad news out there. In fact, bad news sells at a higher rate than good news. But the good news we're talking about is that announcement that Jesus came to say that he had fulfilled everything that the law and the prophets had given to the Old Testament writers, that he was the incarnation of God. God with us, Emmanuel had come, and Jesus is our jubilee. Somebody said, that's awfully good news, amen? Jesus is good news. Uh, we've been tracking along the book of Mark. We've been in the Gospel of Mark uh, all year so far. I've just got a couple more weeks to share with you in Mark. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Mark chapter 10. We are in the 10th chapter of Mark this morning. And I have a question for you to maybe subtitle the message. The question is this, what do you want? Just look to your neighbor and say, what do you want? Because oftentimes what we want is not what we need. And what we need is not often what we want. I think it's important at the onset of this message to acknowledge that as human beings, we all have wants. There are preferences. We all have things that we would desire or prefer over another thing. You can uh, take a quick survey of, of any group of people and you know that some people would prefer chocolate ice cream over vanilla. Others would prefer to have pizza rather than pasta. There are all kinds of preferences. And if you are in church very long, you'll recognize that people sitting on the same church row as you have different desires or preferences than you have. Somebody say, oh me. (laughs) That's right. We all want a little bit different things. But the question we're going to focus on today is what do you want? Because Jesus asked this this all-important question to a man that uh, truly had a desire in his heart, and he knew what he wanted, but he had to express his want. And oftentimes, our strongest wants are not our deepest desires. The, The things that we really want are not what we really need. I would admit to you that oftentimes my strongest want for a dessert overpowers my deepest need for some exercise. Anybody really do what I'm saying there? I really, really want that other bite of dessert, but I really need not to have it and need to get on the treadmill instead. So it it illustrates to us that so many times in life, our strongest desire is not our deepest need. And we have to understand the difference. Before we get to uh, that particular question in Mark chapter 10, I have to address some hot topics. Somebody say hot topics. Now, I am not uh, looking to be political today, but I am going to be biblical today as every day because I believe that we should preach the whole counsel of God, the easy parts as well as the difficult ones. Amen. I think that we should not skirt around uh, those issues that may cause a little bit of uncomfortability to our listeners or even to ourselves, but we need to rightly divide the word of truth, preaching the entire counsel of God. And there are some hot topics that Jesus addresses in 12 verses here at the onset that really are revolutionary in their day of teaching, but they're nonetheless still clear teaching to us today. So let's look at Mark 10, verses 1 through 12. It says, Then he rose from there and came to the region of Judea by the other side of Jordan, and multitudes gathered to him again. As he was custom, he taught them again. This is now a teaching of Jesus. This wasn't a whim or, or maybe uh, I haven't developed my thoughts yet on this. What we're about to look at is a teaching of Jesus. And this is an all-time forever established in the roots of God's word teaching that came from the mouth of of Christ. Now look at verse 2. It says, the Pharisees came and asked him. We keep seeing this same group of people again and again. These Pharisees, these are the ones who were in charge of the religious ruling class of their day. So they were just a little bit threatened by this new uh, found person named Jesus that was kind of challenging uh, many of their cultural norms. Jesus was, was really kind of a thorn in their flesh. And we see them again and again. And it says, the Pharisees came and asked him. Here's the question. Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Now, the Bible says they were testing him. 
And he answered and he said to them, now don't you love how Jesus answers a question? He always answers a question with a question. Like, I'm not going to get tripped up by your philosophy. Jesus answers this question by saying, well, what did Moses command you? Of course, they couldn't knock on no, M- Moses. Of course, Elijah and the prophets. Of, Moses was really high up in their book. So Jesus turns the tables a bit and he says, before I answer your question, answer me. What does Moses command? They said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate get divorcement and dismiss his wife. And Jesus answered and said to them, because of the hardness of your hearts, he wrote to you this precept. But from the beginning of creation, Jesus goes all the way back. His teaching started all the way back at creation. In other words, what Jesus is establishing is bedrock foundation. Somebody say bedrock, bedrock. foundation. He goes all the way back to the beginning of creation to say, Anything that happens is going to be line upon line, precept upon precept. What Jesus was about to reveal to them in this teaching is not some newfangled thing. Jesus is about to reveal to them a revelation of what has been established from God from eons past and is bedrock and foundational. Here's what he says. From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason... A man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. In the house, his disciples also asked him again, saying uh, about this matter. uh, So he said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if a woman divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery against her against him, or she commits adultery, as Jesus said. So the Pharisees were asking Jesus to take a side. The Pharisees wanted to test him, but they really kind of wanted to pin him down to say, what do you really believe about some of these hot topics of our day? And often when there is a hot topic, when there is a hot potato, when there is a divisive matter in our day, each side claims that Jesus would, in fact, endorse their side. And we're really good also at finding Bible verses to back up why Jesus would endorse us. But here's what I want to caution you about. Be very, very careful when you claim that Jesus endorses all of your theology, all of your political views, all of your wants, and all of your preferences, for every side tries to do that. And this may come as a shock to some, But God is not a Republican or a Democrat. And so when we try to heap up all the rationale and all the reasons why God is on our side and he's against those other people, it really doesn't build a bridge of dialogue and conversation and being salt and light. What it does is it silos us in different directions and it causes us not to be able to reach across the aisle, not to be able to reach across with compassion and love to people who don't agree with us in order to get a hearing from them of the word of God. Sometimes we have to be patient enough with someone's folly or what we would perceive as their wrong thinking to hear them out And then say, okay, I have heard you out. I understand what you're saying. Now can I give you my position? Can I share with you my side? And can I also share with you from God's word why that I arrive at that point? We need some civil dialogue to be restored to our politics, to our churches, and to our relationships in the United States of America today. In these 12 short verses, Jesus addresses these hot topics. And they're very easy to miss, but he addresses gender identity. Biblical marriage and divorce. Two of the three are hot debated topics and dividing lines of our day. One of them, the last one, divorce, used to be a hot topic 20 or 30 years ago, but now it's lost its bombast. It's lost kind of its, its, uh, its sway. But I think that we, we can still learn something from Jesus' teaching here. So let's get into it. The first one is gender identity. Jesus is clear that from the beginning, right at creation, there were two, male and female. Now, I know that in our humanness, in our philosophy, in our logic, in our Western civilization mindset of, of always being smarter and modern, we like to add things, we like to discover things, we like to nuance things, and we do this so often with Scripture. That now, today, with 
uh, gender fluidity, there are some 30-some genders that have been named among college campuses and, and on surveys, and, and you look at some questionnaires, and they'll say male, female, other, you know, whatever. There is no other. It is male and female. Now, please hear my heart here. I do not minimize for one moment the very real spiritual attack on identity and spirituality in our day. It's very real. In fact, the heat has turned up really high on our young people, particularly, of confusion and shame that entails from not really feeling comfortable in their own skin. And when someone who has a degree or someone who is of a position of authority tells them that it's completely fine for them to just kind of be fluid and flow from one stream to another stream, that might sound good and it might sound patting on the back for the moment, but it breeds confusion and it breeds chaos in their own heart later. And Jesus very clearly said this, from the very beginning of creation, two genders, male and female. Now, if you struggle in this area, please hear me. Reach out to me. Let's talk. Let's sit down. Let's have a cup of coffee without condemnation, without fear, without judgment, without reprisal. I want to hear your story because there is a backstory to why you're feeling and why you're struggling with what you're struggling with. And the church cannot simply just minimize that and cast it off as though that you just need to get over it. No, there are some things that can happen in a life that is informed by the word of God. By the washing of the water of the word, our minds are renewed. And that's how we become more and more like Jesus. Can somebody say amen in the house of God? The next one is biblical marriage. Notice that Jesus said nothing here in his teaching about a ceremony, about a piece of paper from the state that sanctions someone to be married. He did, however, endorse this union of two becoming one. Now, I would say, by all means, get the designations. Make things as official as you possibly can. But here's what I've noticed is that some couples spend way more money and time preparing for a 30-minute ceremony than they do for a lifelong marriage. They spend way more time picking out the cake and the dress and what the groomsmen and bridesmaid are going to wear than how they're going to structure their life and family after they say, I do. And that's why that in this day and in this age, it's so easy just to go ahead and cut and run and do something different. Because when we said for better or worse, we kind of had our fingers crossed and we were saying, well, as long as it goes the way that I want it to go. But Jesus said that when the two unionize, when they come together, they become one flesh. He goes on a little further. He says, therefore, what God has joined together, let not man put asunder. And so therefore, biblical marriage is one man, one woman living in holy matrimony for their entirety of life. That is biblical marriage. Now, I'm not going to say traditional marriage. I know that many in the culture wars will try to say traditional marriage because traditionally that's what it's been. But here's the problem with naming something traditional marriage is that anything traditional in a republic like we live in, we don't live in a democracy, by the way. We live in a republic, but we, we, we'll learn our history later, okay? But truly, we, we, we elect representatives to go and do the will of the people. But the way that our, our structure is in this in this. United States of America, where we have shared powers, is that a majority vote of elected officials can change and redefine entire terms that have been traditional. They have legal authority to do so. And unelected judges can make rulings of opinions. They call them legal, what? Opinions. Legal opinions. Lawyers are practicing the law. They never perfect it. They are just practicing. And so here's the problem with allowing something traditional to say, well, it's always been that way. No, it doesn't matter whether it's traditional or not in the kind of republic we live, it can be voted out. But, but just, I would caution you that the same ones that with a majority vote or a majority opinion can uh, legislate that away are also the very same crowd in Washington, both Republicans and Democrats, by the way, and independents that will tell us, that's okay, just go ahead and spend more money. Inflation is actually good for the economy. These are the same people that wink and nod and have backroom deals, and we're letting them legislate our morality? No, there is no legislation of morality. God didn't say vote on it. He said, I established it. It's right here. 
And so biblical marriage is between a man and a woman in holy matrimony for the longevity of their life. You can call anything else anything you want to call it. That, that, hey, you know what? I don't really have a beef with that. We, we live in a republic. People can do is that I'm not trying to legislate morality on anybody. I'm not going to condemn you for the way that, that you choose to walk out your life. The word of God already has acclamations and condemnations. I don't have to be the one that stands as your judge, jury, and executioner. Let everything, the scripture tells us, let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Why do they say that? Well, when someone would come before a court of law, they would have to uh, have some kind of testimony as to why that is. And so any principle that I teach in the word of God, I want to make sure that I and you later can go back it up by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Jesus gives us that here in this, this very short teaching. He says, from the beginning, it was male and female, and that a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. There's three witnesses right there, male, female, mother, father, husband, and wife. We have the biblical definition right here for us according to the words and teaching of Jesus. Let's look at the third one here, divorce. Now, what was Jesus talking about and how were they trying to trap him in this discussion? So in Jesus' day, there were two schools of thought of, of Jewish teaching on divorce. The first one was the Shamites. They were very strict. They only allowed divorce for justifiable reasons of adultery and physical abuse. Those were the only two reasons that they even allowed divorce. And then there were the Hillites. We could call them the Hellites, really, because they allowed divorce for anything that displeased the man about his wife. Even to the point of if she burned his food, he could divorce her. If he simply found a more attractive woman, he could divorce his wife. Now, here's the, the crux of this question is, can a man divorce his wife? Is because what they were trying to ask Jesus is, which school of thought do you land on? Jesus, are you a Democrat or Republican? That's what, kind of what they were asking him, right? I mean, that's, that's my vernacular of it. And so Jesus asked them a question, well, what did Moses say? And they, they clearly told what Moses said. And he said, you know what? Moses gave you that commandment because your hearts were hard because you really didn't understand the principle of the two becoming one in the first place. And, and when you track it on down, uh, what Moses was doing was something that was very compassionate to the woman that if she burned the husband's food and he divorced her, she didn't have many options once the husband divorced her of how to even provide for herself. She either had to uh, work in a house of ill repute and become a prostitute, or she had to rely on a family member maybe to provide for her. But if she was a woman that was divorced, very few would even do that. She was kind of like a commodity to be dealt with, like traded and bargained. She didn't have very many rights. And so Moses said, at least we'll give them the ability to write a certificate of divorce so that she can go get a job again and she doesn't have to be a woman of ill repute. And so this was, this was kind of a, a good teaching, I guess you could say, that Moses allowed for this. But Jesus, one of the very few times you see, actually took a position and he goes into that first class where he says, it is only for a couple of reasons, only for these reasons that you can adultery or, or abuse that you can, you can be divorced. But he said, if they're divorced and they remarry, then what's he talking about? They commit adultery. And what he's talking about here is the pain of divorce. He goes on further and says, whatever God puts together, let not man put asunder. I'm gonna tell you right now that there are a lot of unions that man has put together. It wasn't God. <laughs> and especially, I don't want anybody getting under condemnation because probably 50% of, of this audience, because 50% of America, 50% of the people watching us have been through a divorce. And so there's, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, okay? Me personally, when I went through my first divorce, I felt like I, I had done something wrong. Something was wrong with me. Like, how did things fail on my watch? How, how did things go so terribly bad that this union has now broken up? And it was particularly tough when I went through my first divorce because I was only 10 years old. When I looked at my parents and the pain in their eyes and the agony of the, the aftermath of that breakup, now, since that day, I'm going to be 43 on Tuesday, and I have witnessed hundreds of divorces, and so have you. And we've witnessed the breakup of marriages and how that, that divides families, how that, that leaves little leaguers and lonely cheerleaders in the wake 
of trying to put the pieces back together. At 10 years old, I wasn't ready to be the man of the house, but that's exactly as the older brother what I was, the man of the house. I wasn't prepared for that. And Jesus, with a heavy heart, is teaching about how divorce rocks and shakes a life. And maybe you haven't had divorce visit your family, but these many divorces of friendships that have broken up or friends and co-workers that used to do things together and they've splintered and they've split. And see, every one of those is like a little mini divorce. And listen to the teaching of Jesus when he says, this is not God's intent. God did not want for us to put things together just to tear them apart again. But he gives us this teaching so that we understand that there is hope and there is help and there is grace even on the other side of bad decisions. Now that is good news. Somebody say, that's good news. We get into the next uh, portion here of the text. Uh, I I love this in in, in, uh, verse 17 through 22 is that uh, there is this this rich young ruler. Let me just uh, get back here to it. This rich young ruler comes to Jesus. This man uh, transitioning out out of that context, he comes to Jesus and he says, I have followed you now, I've been watching you, and and I want to know what I can do to obtain eternal life. And here's what he says in verse 20. I don't know that I gave this to him in the media, but he says, and he answered him and said, teacher, I have done all of these things from my youth. What things? When Jesus goes through a list of some of the 10 commandments, you know the commandments, don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother, don't lie. And he said, you know, I've done all of those things since my youth. This rich young ruler comes to Jesus and said, okay, Tell me what I must do to inherit eternal life. In verse 21, it says, Then Jesus, looking at him, loved him. Hear this. Jesus looked at this man who was a rule keeper, this man who had done everything according to checking the box, everything he was taught to do. Jesus loved him, and he said to him, One thing you lack. One thing. And I don't know about you, but if I'm taking a 100 question test and I know the answer to 99 of them, but I just don't have that one last thing, I'm pretty confident to go ahead and turn in that paper and I'll take my A plus. Thank you very much. I'm sure that this man was really expecting Jesus pat on the back to say, wow, you kept all those rules. You've done so great. You have kept all the laws. But no, Jesus looking at him with love and compassion in his eyes He said, but there's one thing you still lack. I can imagine this man on just the heels of his feet waiting. What is that one thing? What one thing? And Jesus said these words to him, go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor. And when you have, uh, and when you have, you have treasure in heaven and then come take up your cross and follow me. But he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard is it for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God? And after this, the disciples were astonished at his words because Jesus said again, children, how hard is it for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of heaven? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to get into heaven. The eye of a needle? A camel? to pass through the eye of a needle. Now, some have said that there was a, a, uh, a gateway into the city of Jerusalem that was, was kind of burrowed out. It was kind of small. They called it the, the eye of the needle and that a camel would get down and it would crawl and it would go under the, the gate and it would get in there. That, that's some people's translation. But I really think that they had sewing back then. They knew what it, uh, it was to thread a needle. And Jesus was hyperbolically speaking about the difficulty of someone who put their trust in riches to enter into this blessed life that he's talking about, the life of the kingdom. And it's illustrated and punctuated with the delivery to this man who had great wealth. It wasn't that Jesus tells all of us to this day that we need to sell all of our riches and give it to the poor and then we can enter into the kingdom of heaven. This was a specific command that Jesus gave to this man. And the reason that Jesus gave this command was because he identified something that was deeper in his heart relationship with God that needed to be excised, something that needed to be dealt with. And that was a matter of trust. 
Because getting into the kingdom of heaven is all about trust. It's not about works. It's not about righteousness. And Jesus was telling this guy, you can keep all the laws, you can do all the rules. But if there's something you're withholding in the area of trust in your life, then you will not walk into this good kingdom. And so Jesus identified that one thing that this man trusted more in, which was his possessions. And then Jesus categorically says, every person who has accomplished great material wealth who has built up and heaped up possessions, there is this human nature desire on the inside not to lose. How many of you, when you get your your 401k, your IRA statement every month, you open it up and you see, did it go up or did it go down? And when it goes down, you feel sad. When it goes up, you feel happy, right? It's this yin-yang, this teeter totter back and forth and so these possessions give us something to hold on to that we no longer want to lose and we trust in that someday we're going to get enough in there that we can tell the man in the front office adios i'm out of here i'm retiring i've got myself something built up that i can live on for a little while see we have this trust in our 401k, in our mutual funds, in our our money saved, in our possessions. And what Jesus said is that if you trust in those things, then you're not trusting in God. And this rich young ruler illustrates for us what it means to not trust in the eternal living God. And it's okay to have things. And I encourage you to, to, to plan and to strategize and to save and have retirement. You should do all of those wise things so that in your later years, you have an ability that you can be generous and you can give and you can, you can be a person of the kingdom and watch the money that you have acc- accumulated go out to work, not only for you and your family, but also for other families as you are able and put in the position to bless people. Thank God for that. Thank God for wise stewards and people that have, have great uh, ability to, to manage money and finances. That's wonderful. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about trust. So whatever you are trusting more in that you won't give up to God, that's the very thing that Jesus is identifying. And then in verses 35 through 45, I won't read the whole thing, but it's talking about uh, this request that James and John had that they wanted to sit on the right and left of Jesus. They wanted to be great in the kingdom. So I asked you earlier, what do you want? These men wanted to be great. They wanted their name to be known. They wanted to have a a premium and, and prestigious seat in the kingdom of God. And Jesus said, it's not for me to divvy out those seats. It's to my heavenly father. It's to the one who has given me this assignment. Now let's go to verse 46. This is the story I was trying to get to right here at the end of Mark chapter 10. We see all of the book of Mark so far, the miracles of Jesus, everything that is, is marching to this midway point because we're about to have a transition here when Jesus foretells his own death. And these last eight chapters of the book of Mark, starting really in, in chapter eight and going to chapter 16, they are all about Jesus going to Jerusalem, foretelling his own death and resurrection, yet the disciples couldn't quite hear or understand it. Next week, we're gonna look at uh, the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday. We're gonna look at how that he came into the city and what exactly the, the inner makings and the things that were happening around that. But before we do, Jesus is, is really en route to his destiny. He is en route to Jerusalem, the holy city. And he goes through Jericho and it says, as he went out of Jericho with his disciples, a great multitude Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. So we have this named character gets interjected right here into the story. While Jesus is on his way to his destiny, this crowd gathers and there is a man named Bartimaeus. Verse 47, and when he heard that Jesus, that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Me. I think that that would be a pretty good prayer for us to just tuck away in our own prayer journal. And every now and then we just simply cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Maybe it's not blindness of eyes for you, but there is something in your life that Jesus, he just needs to touch you with his mercy. How many are thankful for the mercy of God? Oh, I thank God for his mercy. His mercies, which are new every morning. If it had not been for God's mercy and for his loving grace, we would have been swallowed up. But this man, Bartimaeus, heard that Jesus was coming by. Verse 48 says, Then many warned him to be quiet. 
Be quiet, Bartimaeus. But he cried all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still. This, get the picture. This crowd is pressing in on Jesus. Lots of people. They want to see this wonder worker. They want to know if there's another miracle to happen. And here you've got this lowly beggar crying at the top of his voice. They had already heard him so many times before. They had passed by Bartimaeus many times before. And they're saying, hush up, be quiet. Jesus isn't for your kind. Jesus don't want anything to do with you. Jesus is important, Bartimaeus. Don't you understand? You're delaying this man. Stop making a ruckus. But to their chagrin... He was the exact kind of people that Jesus was after because look what it says. It says, so Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. They were amazed. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer. Now they changed their tune. Listen, isn't it funny? They changed their tune. Oh, you do hear Bartimaeus? You do want, oh, Bartimaeus, look, it's great. It's your lucky day. Jesus wants you to come here too. And they said, rise, be of good cheer, for he is calling for you. And somebody needs to hear this this morning, that Jesus is calling for you. Jesus is issuing a plea to you. Jesus is issuing an invitation to you. He is calling to you. Verse 50, and throwing aside his garment, he arose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want? You see that right there? What do you want? I ask you, what do you want? Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately, somebody say immediately. He received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Let me ask you a couple of questions as they get ready and we're going to close. Do we sometimes get desensitized to the plight of those around us? This entire crowd was following Jesus. No doubt they had followed him for a while, yet they were still not truly in tune with the heart of Jesus is that he really cared about Bartimaeus. Do we sometimes get desensitized to the plight of those around us? They told him to be quiet. And if he would have done that, if he would have just piped down and and taken the crowd's advice, then he would have missed out on his miracle. And I ask you this, are you too easily turned aside from calling out to Jesus all because of people's opinions? I sure hope that you never come into New Freedom Church and you feel like you can't lift up your hands because you look around and someone might see you. I hope that you never feel that in New Freedom Church, you can't freely just walk down to the altar and kneel for a time of prayer because someone might think that you sin. Newsflash, we've all sinned. And it's God's goodness that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus the righteous, that when we sin, we can come to him and we can say, I've messed up, I need forgiveness again. We have an advocate with Jesus standing at the right hand of God, saying, that's one I died for. Are you too easily turned aside from calling out to Jesus? Take a lesson from Bart today. Call out to Jesus. He wants to hear your plea. Now look at this. This is an odd question. Jesus asked, what do you want me to do for you? It was very clear to everyone what Bartimaeus needed He needed to see. Everybody knew what he needed, but Jesus asked, what do you want? Because maybe what he wanted was just a little dab will do you blessing on the forehead so that he could go back to bacon again. Maybe all that he wanted was to be recognized that someone saw him in the crowd, but as long as he could still beg and he could ask for alms, as long as he still had that cloak around his shoulders, he could still be ineligible to beg. But look what Jesus asked him, what do you want? And I believe that there was already faith being activated by Bartimaeus because the Bible says that he threw off his coat. You know what he did is he got rid of his enablement. Bartimaeus' cloak in that day was a sign that he's truly blind. Someone had examined him and they've said, yeah, he's blind, he's allowed to beg. It was like having a certificate saying, you're allowed to beg. It'd be kind of akin to like a a, a handicap sign in our day. Like you don't park in the handicap spot unless you've got the placard, right? That was what he was doing. This would be like a person tearing up the handicap thing saying, today I'm gonna walk. 
Today I'm going to see. I'm never going to have to park in that spot ever again because I'm about to get a blessing from Jesus today. And that's what he did. Because he threw off his coat. This is an odd question. Jesus said, what do you want? He knew what he needed. After all, he'd been begging this all of his life. But, but here's what I want to ask you. Do you want your wants or do you want your needs? Do you want just your preferences to be filled? Do you just want to be a little bit happy today? Or do you want what you really need? That soul condition being taken care of by Jesus. You see, some people make a habit of fulfilling their wants and then they have to beg for all their needs. And that was Bartimaeus. He had to beg. Jesus don't want us to beg. Last question. Do you want all God has for you? Or do you just want to get through the current storm? Do you just want to buy a little bit of insurance until the next time? See, some people are content just to get through this storm, but Bartimaeus wasn't. He wanted all God had for him. And when Jesus asked him, what do you want? He said that I might see. He chose rightly, didn't he church? Because what he really wanted was the very thing he needed the most. Heads bowed and no one looking around. What do you need today? And what do you want? Do you want your wants? Things you could do without? Or do you really want your needs? You see, each and, of ha- each and every one of us, we have this God-shaped hole on the inside. It's a need that only God can fill. And when we get spiritually hungry, spiritually thirsty, the Bible tells us that those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, that need will be filled. God, today, I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice in person and online who is searching their heart right now for their needs, desiring before you to be whole, to be complete, that they might see spiritually. And with a simple act of faith, if we throw off our cloak of entitlement, if we throw off that desire just to make it through the next storm, you promise to us that we will have life abundant. It all comes with a simple act of repentance to say, God, I'm wrong. I accept you as my answer to every problem. I confess Jesus before you. God, I confess Jesus as my Savior and my Lord.